What's going on folks? Ted from Nerd Immersion here and it's time to do a top 10 of my absolute favorite class and that is the top 10 magic items for Paladin in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. If you want to see what the specifics are, stay tuned. So as per usual, the specifics on this are what you've come to expect, but I did want to say you can't really see it because there's sun glare on it, but I'm at 99,000 400 subscribers are actually very close to 500 so if you haven't subscribed to the channel please consider doing so i'd love to throw a huge party at pax unplugged for celebrating 100k subscribers but we only have less than a month to do that so consider subscribing but as i said the specifics are what you've come to expect first of all consider pairing this video with my video that or revitalized rather the uh 2022 version of these magic item lists which is top 10 magic items for all classes, you'll take that and then add that into everything here specifically for Paladin, so mix and match accordingly. We are only covering uh, uncommon, very rare, and uh, uh, rare magic items, rather. We're not doing any legendary magic items. And the reason that I do that, for those of you who've been asking, is because usually most games don't get to a point where they can even encounter a legendary magic item, and if so... There might not be enough for everyone in the party, so I like to reserve those for something else. Although some of you have suggested, could I do a series covering basically, uh, maybe I'll do a short series? Let me know your thoughts uh, of like the number one legendary magic item for each class and just do a short, less than 60 second video on each class. Here's the one that I would suggest. Let me know. Maybe I'll do that. We're also not going to include any consumable magic items in here. Potions, scrolls, or things that have an unlimited number of charges. Again, I continue to use the Chime of Opening as an example. You use it, and then once the charges are gone, it's effectively destroyed. We're also not covering any of the tomes or manuals that increase any of your ability scores, because those, one, can kind of be considered a consumable, but any of them are useful for anyone. So those just kind of are in a tier of their own. And lastly, we're not doing anything that's specifically tied to a certain subclass, right? We want this to be subclass agnostic. So if you're playing a paladin, regardless of what paladin you're, uh, you know, what you specialize into, these will be useful for you. So let's jump in. Number 10. The Watchful Helm. This comes to us, this very rare magic item from Candlekeep Mysteries. It does require attunement, and it gives you a plus one to AC, and you remain aware of your surroundings while you're asleep, and also have advantage on perception checks that rely on sight. As a bonus action, you can cast see invisibility from the helm once uh, per day, basically once till the next dawn. The reason I put this on here, one, the plus one to AC, no one's going to say anything, no one's going to be against that. I also will say that I really don't like that there's not art for a lot of the magic items that have come out since basically the originals. I'm very curious what a watchful helm looks like. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. But for your auras to work, your paladin auras, you need to be either, I think it's conscious. Uh, I, I think basically, actually, you know what? Why don't we just go ahead and look up the paladin auras? But Paladin Auras are one of the most powerful abilities you have as a Paladin. They're a great, a great passive buff that you have on all the time, as long as your allies are close to you. So the thing is, here it is. Uh, let's see. Uh, whenever you are a friendly creature with next saving throw, actually? Oh, you must be conscious to grant this bonus, right? So, you remain aware of your surroundings even while you're asleep, therefore knowing what's going on, so you can be, you can wake up if someone's going to ambush your party, and then boom, auras are all on, whether that be, and this really works because a lot of the different subclasses provide separate auras, immunity to charm, resistance to damage from spells, higher level paladins grant immunity to fear, right? The fact that you can see what's happening even though you're technically asleep, this allows you to kind of get around stuff. For example, like a half-elf or an elf can use trance to get around this, but this works for everybody else. And even if you are a half-elf or an elf, you can still get the free C invisibility to help you get, you know, deal with that. And the advantage on perception checks that'll possibly give you a bonus to passive perception as well, as long as it's based on sight. All around a good item. I really like this item a lot, and I just, I really want to know what it looks like. Number nine. 
the Amulet of the Devout. This varying uh, uh, rarity magic item comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It's only attunable by clerics or paladin, and in these kind of variable magic items that we're used to, you have uncommon, rare, and very rare, and they provide a plus one, plus two, or plus three bonus accordingly. Uh, when you, while you wear said holy symbol, you gain a bonus to your attack rolls uh, and spell, uh, spell save DC and spell attack rolls to the associated number, either plus one, plus two, or plus three. Um, the reason this is so high on this list is most, I I'm going to say your spells as a paladin, while useful and great utility, more often than not, this is going to be a more useful item on a cleric because the clerics has a lot more powerful, uh, spells and different abilities. I don't think any paladin has a spell attack roll. There might be like a fifth level spell that is a spell attack roll or some of the newer spells that were added. But for the most part, you don't have any. So that's useless because you don't usually have cantrips. Although I guess if you use Tasha's Cauldron rules, you could get them. And again, most of your spells, a lot of the time, people end up using most of their spell slots for smiting. Although again, there are situations where not. But I feel most of those are healing spells. Healing word, or I'm sorry, cure wounds, revivify, things like that, P uh, the restoration spells, people are utilizing those uh, with their spell slots. Now, again, I'm not saying that, or even the smite spells, right? They don't use uh, a spell save DC for, you know, a handful of them. Some of them do. But again, I, I feel like this is better utilized for a cleric. However, it does also have the ability that you can use your channel divinity feature without expending one of the feature's uses once until the next dawn, especially given the new features added in Tasha's Cauldron where you can use your channel divinity to gain a spell slot back. That means more smiting. This means even more so. Number eight. We were just talking about more smiting, so the Pearl of Power. This is an uncommon magic item, comes to us from the basic rules. It is a two-mint, but basically, while it's on your person, you can use an action to speak its command word and get back an expended spell slot. It can be, uh, uh, it's basically a third level slot, right? So if the expended spell slot was fourth level or higher, the new slot is third. Again, paladins only ever get up to fifth level slots, and that's not till much later on in the game. So being able to get a spell slot back, again, it could be used for spell casting or it could just be an opportunity to get more smites back. Uh, and again, it's an uncommon item, so the chances of you coming across one are uh, pretty likely in the grand scheme of things. Number seven. The Guardian Emblem. This holy symbol is uncommon. It requires a tomb. It comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And basically, it allows you to get the benefits of some of the Grave Cleric ability, but on a Paladin in this instance. It has three charges, and when you are a creature you can see within 30 feet of you suffers a critical hit. While wearing this, uh, the armor that has this emblem on it, you can use your reaction to expend one of the three charges and turn it into a normal hit. You get all three charges back daily at dawn. As a paladin, you typically don't have a lot of use for your reaction outside of opportunity attacks. And as the sort of uh, tanky utility healer type, I mean, again, paladins can devote themselves purely to damage for sure. But you kind of have a good role in the party where you can do a little bit of everything. And being able to negate a critical hit is huge because then that potentially allows you or someone else to follow up with more healing. Or potentially allows a player character, an ally, to stay in the fight another round rather than being knocked out. Uh, so that allows the, you know, the whole battle dynamic to shift. Number six. The Javelin of Lightning. This uncommon non-attunement item comes to us from the basic rules, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. The Javelin of Lightning is basically a way to get some kind of cool, ranged, pseudo-AoE lightning damage on a martial character. More often than not, as a paladin, you will not have traditionally a lot of ranged combat. Again, not to say that that's impossible with thrown weapons and things, I personally have never seen and or played alongside a dexterous based paladin. I know they exist. If you played one, I'd love to hear the story about it. But for the most part, people are usually heavy armor and strength based. So having some sort of long reaching weapon, uh, again, some maybe use cantrips and things. But for the most part, I feel most people are up close and personal in melee. Therefore, they can utilize smites. But the Javelin of Lightning has a couple of cool things going for it, right? You throw the javelin, you speed the command word, it turns into a bolt of lightning, 
fires out, forming a line five feet wide and extends out to a target you choose within 120 feet. Uh, and then each creature within the line between you and said target must make a DC 13 deck save or take 46 lightning damage half on a success. Uh, and then the target that you hit takes the damage from the javelin, the base javelin damage of a D6 plus your strength modifier, plus an additional 46 lightning damage. So basically you are extending, normally a javelin has a 30 foot regular range and 120 foot long range. You are extending that to basically give yourself the full length of that with no issues with disadvantage. You make your attack, you attack at, it turns into the lightning bolt. You pick that person if they're hit by the initial attack they take the initial damage of the javelin plus that lightning and then you get the line effect basically a half a damage of a lightning bolt for anybody in between uh however it is only usable until the next dawn so once you utilize it the magic of the lightning part of it is gone however it still can be wielded as a magical javelin you'll just have to go and pick it up but there's nothing saying you can't stab somebody physically with a javelin to basically get around that uh, lack of magical weapons if you're trying to overcome damage resistance. So it has multiple uses, and it's just really cool to see in action. Number five. The various belts of giant strength. They have varying rarity all the way up to legendary, and they come from the basic rules, and based the different gi uh, giant base belts have a different rarity and an associated strength. And basically they set your strength at whatever it is. So if you have the lowest level, the rare level, the belt of hill giant strength, it sets your strength at a 21. This is what normally the cap would be. 20 is the cap on any ability score without any sort of finagling. So for you, you'd be able to have a 20, basically the equivalency of a 20 strength for one rare attunement magic item. If you jump up to very rare, you'll see you have three different options here. Frost giant, stone giant, or fire giant taking you up to 23 or 25, depending on which one you get. I always thought it was weird that Frost Giant and Stone Giant had the same strength number for some reason. Um, but as a Paladin, like I said in the last, talking about the Javelin of Lightning, more often than not, Paladins are typically uh, strength-based fighters wearing heavy armor. So you don't have anything like a Barbarian does at max level that boosts your strength and your constitution. Your strength typically will max out at 20 unless you have a means to get around it. So if you have access to a belt of hill giant strength early on, you can basically jumpstart your strength to maximum. Or uh, if you're able to get one of the other belts, you can go above and beyond and get yourself a little bit extra. Uh, this will also, you know, again, if you were worried about possibly being able to wear plate mail based on the, the strength requirement, this will get you around that. And again, it'll increase your to hit and your damage. Number four. Mizium armor makes an appearance once again. This is a magical material based armor that is found uh, in the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. So the only potential downside here is that your DM may not use it, but it is considered a magical material. And so I kind of allow it in all of my games. And essentially, I guess if you don't use Mizium in your games, I would replace this with Adamantine because it provides all of the benefits that Adamantine armor provides and then a little something extra. If you're unfamiliar with adamantine armor, it is an uncommon magic item that basically makes any critical hit against you a normal hit. So you could have this on and then possibly use the guardian emblem from earlier on to use that to primarily only prevent your allies' critical hits uh, turning into normal hits where you'll just kind of avoid those entirely wearing your armor. Mizium armor, again, has that any critical hit against you becomes a normal hit, but it also has, in addition, when you're subjected to a magical effect that allows you to make a strength or constitution saving throw to take only half damage, you take no damage if you succeed. I really like this. I like this armor a lot. It can be on medium or heavy armor. You can get it, obviously, all the way up to a to plate mail if you so choose. And I really like this. I think this works well with the Paladin rate. You're going to add your Charisma modifier to all of your saving throws anyway, potentially allowing you to better succeed on something like a Strength or Constitution saving throw. Uh, you have the, you know, that aura comes online at level six. You could, if you're wielding a sword and a shield, you could possibly use the Shield Master benefit to have, you know, dexterity based, um, you know, if you have interpose your shield and you succeed on a dexterity saving throw, you could take no damage. 
this is a really cool concept. If you can get all of these aspects working together, you're then able to possibly mitigate quite a bit of damage, allowing you to stay in and continue to tank if that's what the role you've been assigned in the party. Or I guess keep DPSing if that's the role. Number three. The Pariah's Shield. This rare attunement magic item comes to us from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica as well. And I really like this item, and I don't feel like I've seen it come up very often. And it's really cool because it kind of does that concept of, like, phalanx things. You see this in sometimes MMOs and other RPGs, where if a group of people in the party all equip the same item, it provides, like, a general buff to everyone. And I really like this. So, again, it is... A regular shield, however, you gain a plus one to your AC for every ally, every two allies within five feet of you, up to a maximum of plus three. Uh, and then, in a so there's that, first of all. Now, I think this is a really useful thing for a paladin to have because of the aforementioned auras that we've talked about. Auras typically start at a distance of 10 feet. Again, if you manage to get all the way to level 18 within your paladin, they'll jump out to 30 feet, which is crazy. Um, but if you're within a 10-foot radius of the paladin, you'll benefit from their auras. Oath of the Ancients happens to be my favorite paladin, so if you, if I'm playing my Oath of the Ancients paladin and I'm at least level 10, and you find yourself within 10 feet of me, you're adding my Charisma modifier to all your saving throws, you're going to take half damage from all spells, and you're also going to be immune to fear. And it benefits all of us for you to stay within my aura, and then even further so, I'm further benefited and potentially able to tank even more by having that many more allies within five feet of me, boosting up the AC bonus of my shield, which is pretty cool. On top of that, there's also when a creature you can see within five feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to take that damage instead of the creature. Uh, when you do so, the damage type changes to force. So you have the shield, someone's going to take damage. This is, again, another option to give your paladin a reaction that they might not have. Now, it also says when they're going to take damage. So we mentioned earlier on the Guardian em Emblem allows you to take a critical hit and turn it into a normal hit. This potentially would also allow you to take a critical hit and take it yourself. What's interesting is it says when you do so, the damage changes to force. There is no language in here that says this damage cannot be reduced in any way. So if you have a means to reduce force damage that you take, you will then ultimately take reduced damage. So, for example, your ally gets hit for an attack that would be doing 50 points of damage. You decide to take that hit with your reaction from the Pariah Shield. The damage changes to force. You happen to have resistance to force damage. You instead save them from 50 points of damage and then only take 25 yourself. There are a variety of different ways one could get access. Probably the simplest would be the, um, the Brooch of Shielding. Uh, provides you resistance to force damage. So there are other cool combos you can do with this as well. I just really like it, and I think a Pariah Shield really fits a Paladin overall. Number two. The Necklace of Prayer Beads. I've talked about these before. I was lucky enough to actually get these on my first Paladin that I played in 5th edition, and it was a game changer for me. So I love these because they do a lot of really interesting things. The main benefit of these is, first of all, you get a D4 plus two beads, right? So you roll. That's the downside of it is you don't know how many beads you're going to get. Um, or your DM just determines a number ahead of time and tells you you find prayer beads with X, you know, a necklace with X amount of prayer beads. You also then roll a D20 to randomly determine what the beads you gain are. So the cool thing about it is each bead contains a spell that can be cast from it as a bonus action using your spell save DC if a DC is necessary. So it's going to use your Paladin DC, so if you have an ability to make it higher than normal or it's just really generally naturally high, that helps. And then once you cast a spell from said bead, uh, it can't be cast from it again until the next dawn. What's cool is a lot of the spells on this list cannot be cast as a bonus action normally, and that, as a Paladin, someone who is likely going to be using your action primarily to attack and possibly attack twice, using extra attack if you're a high enough level, and possibly even benefiting from extra damage from something like Improved Divine Smite if you're a high enough level, being able to do a cool spell as a bonus action and then still having your action to do an attack is really, really useful. One of those 
is Bless. Right out the gate, right? Everybody knows what Bless does. Pick up to three creatures. They had a D4 to their attack rolls and their saving throws. Normally, you'd be sacrificing your whole action to do this. To be able to do this and then follow up with two attacks, you're now adding those D4 to those two attacks if you choose yourself as one of the targets, possibly making it even easier for you to hit things. Cure Wounds, a fantastic way. Your only healing spell as it stands aside from Lay on Hands. You have Cure Wounds, but again, that's your whole action. To be able to cure wounds somebody back into the fight and then continue to go on and fight with your action is huge. Same thing with Lesser Restoration. Uh, greater Restoration is... What is the time frame? It's one action. Again, another option there. Branding Smite is a bonus action, so you don't really get any extra benefit of it being a bonus action, but you do get the benefit of being able to cast it for free, potentially without having to prepare it. And then the two big ones here at the end are Planar Ally and Windwalk. Planar Ally takes 10 minutes to cast normally. You are now casting this as a bonus action. Uh, and again, this can be really up to your DM to determine what a planar ally is and how useful it is to you. I've, I've been able, I think, to summon either a unicorn or a pegasus with no problem as a paladin. It was a Mia Leaky paladin, right? So you understand the connection there. Um, but it's kind of up to your DM to decide what the planar ally is, or, you know, you may have a conversation about it. And then Windwalk, also a very potential, potentially useful movement spell. Uh, I think we all saw or remember in the one episode of Critical Role where they tried to cast Windwalk to leave in it very quickly because you have like a 300 foot fly speed when you have Windwalk, but they did it in combat and it normally takes a minute to do. So you wouldn't be able to do it in combat. Normally, you'd have to take a minute to do it and decide you're going to use this for overland travel. Whereas Windwalk out of a Necklace of Prayer Beads as a bonus action is a potential really quick getaway card where you now have 300 feet of movement and you could do that for eight hours, non-concentration. So I love the Necklace of Prayer Beads. Uh, I try to give one out to any Cleric Druid or Paladin that runs in my game because I think they're great. I think you'll enjoy them too. Number one. The Devotee's Sensor. This is, I knew you guys have a magic item, a magic weapon, rather, on uh, on here. So this comes to us, uh, it's a rare magic item. Attunement comes from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And it is a magical flail. I like flails as a non-traditional weapon. Uh, you don't see them too, too often in 5th edition. I mean, there's really no, fundamentally no difference than a from a flail to a sword, with the exception of most of the magic items that exist in 5th edition are based around swords, not flails so first of all it is a magical weapon so you've got that but any target you hit with it takes an extra d8 radiant damage this is really nice because more often than not most holy symbol type holy items in the game that deal radiant damage or something like that seem to only do that extra radiant damage to undead creatures whereas the devotee sensor just does a flat out base extra 1d8 radiant damage regardless of who you're striking so I really like this because, again, if you're a level 11 paladin, you have improved Divine Smite, which means you're dealing the D8 of the Flail, a D8 Radiant Damage from Improved Divine Smite, and an extra D8 Radiant Damage from the Devotee Sensor. So with that, you are dealing a flat 3D8 damage per hit without smites. That is pretty nutty to see. And then if you're able to get something like Haste from an ally, you can then be doing all of that in three times a turn. And if that wasn't enough, it also has the really awesome bonus action feature, which is as a bonus action, speak the command word, and you can see it emanates these clouds of incense that you see in the image above my head here in a radius out to 10 feet for one minute. At the start of each of your turns, you and any creature that's within the 10-foot radius of the incense heal a D4 hit points, Once, and this can only be usable once until the next dawn. Again, we've already talked about the benefit of standing within 10 feet of a paladin with the various auras. This is now providing you potentially over the course of a minute or 10 rounds of combat, 10 D4 healing work, 10 D4 hit points worth of healing. Now, the only downside of this is it heals enemies just as much as it heals allies, which is a downside. Perhaps your DM would allow you to craft something that would allow you to get around that or some sort of possible like linked item that if you know the party members are all wearing it, it only heals them. Or just use this as a quick out-of-combat heal, right? If you're out of combat and you don't have the time to take a short rest, but you have one minute's worth of time, you could very quickly heal the entire party 10d4 hit points in the course of a minute. And then, you know, I mean, that could be a, a not a small chunk of hit points depending on how everybody rolls. So 
you get that going and then you're able to continue on as normal and then even if you don't have that active like i said it is still a flail that does an extra d8 radiant damage on a hit this is absolutely one of my favorite magic items and definitely one of my favorite magic items that they added recently it very much fills the role, I think, of a lot of these. Every class needs their own unique magic item. And unfortunately, there are some classes that still have not had those, like things like Fighter and Barbarian. So maybe we'll get to see those in the future. So anyway, folks, that is my top 10 magic items for Paladin. We will be back next week with everybody's favorite class and mine, <laughs> the Ranger. Uh, the Ranger will be next week. Uh, we'll be talking about top 10 magic items for Rangers. Interestingly enough, though, they did get some unique magic items for them as a result of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which is pretty cool to see, even if they get, they can give them cool magic items, even if they can't seem to figure out what they want to do with the class. Uh, although the one D&D version, a little bit better. So anyway, folks, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. And one last thing, hey, again, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. See you all next time.